Welcome to PTG TV. This is your host, Antonio Hicks. Uh, welcome back to another episode. So first off, let me let me start this off with the, uh, talking about like the gaming content on the channel. So I'm moving all my live streams over to a totally different channel to kind of separate the you know discussions I have here with whether it's tech talks or political talks or even just you know future games coming out or just some gameplay here and there. But all the live streams and other like strictly gaming content has been moved over to the House of Matrix or Matrix channel. You'll see the link in the description. And I tag it up up here somewhere. But um, yeah, just want to get that out real first, real first, <laughs> to get that out before we move on to the topic. So AI, so today's discussion is kind of a little nerdy, but it is AI. So we've, we talked about AI on this channel before, but now Apple has put, is even though Apple has already been working with AI before, but Apple has now put its, its, you know, its car in the race and now you got the three entities running head and head, neck and neck to try to get to, to win y'all's vote on who might be the best one, who y'all using the most. And with that, you have, so now you got three main companies that's doing it. So you got Google Gemini, who's doing it with Google Workspace. You have Microsoft, who is doing it now with Microsoft Copilot. At least on Microsoft computers are just capping. <laughs> but well, the Copilot computers, I'm just like, I don't, that's just a gimmick in itself. And if you buy a computer just for Copilot, I don't know what you're doing. Just go ahead and build one. If it's a laptop, just get a regular laptop. And now you have Apple with this rebranding is the AI to Apple intelligence. So you have, just to get a general understanding of what the three things are that helps in understanding like these language models and stuff. So you have three different processes that are taking place with AI to make them work across all these platforms because all these platforms are doing things that you've, t you've seen with Gemini and how they've integrated into other, uh, not Gemini, with uh, <laughs> ChatGPT and how they've been integrated into other third-party applications. If you have not seen that already, like uh, with certain mails, milling systems, but how it typically works is, so you have machine learning. So it's just, it's just basically just a machine learning language model where it's, it's learning and from like different data that stuff on your computers and how it can make itself more, make itself more smart, I can't even talk today, to help itself improve over time. Then you have your natural language learning models to where it's learning how you actually speak. So all your different cadences and how you enunciate, pronounce words and things of that nature is learning how to understand you from that aspect of it. So when it responds back, it knows exactly what you're saying and what you're asking for because, you know, a lot of us talk differently, especially with here in the US. I mean, we all from the same country and we speak English, but there are different tones and how people use different words and especially with different races and stuff. So it's learning to understand that and how to compute that to, to, to do what you're asking it to do. And then you have your computer vision where it's, anal it's analyzing images and analyzing video to be able to break it down. So if you're asking it to generate particular images, you know, you like you have your text to image based stuff, it can learn how to do just that in creating that stuff for you and analyze video. Cause like now with uh, Gemini on um, Pixel phones, they're, they're pushing it now to be able to be asking a question it can look at some of the data on these videos. Same thing with Apple Intelligence. So Apple just pushed it out with their WWDC conference on how they're integrating their AI into all of their OS. And it's, if you ask it a serious question, then it's looking to uh, go analyze all the things that's on your device, so your onboard device, to be able to bring it up for you, whatever a search is, or to that degree, or whatever. It's not, it hasn't, it's, I don't, it's, well, I don't believe they're doing it. I mean, it could do it later on this year. To where they're doing text to video, but as it stands now, it's just strictly for like searching. So we're gonna dive deeper into like how are these different processes or different applications or AI languages working with all of these the apps with these particular companies. So you have Gemini with Workspace, which Workspace is the same thing as uh, Office 365, and Office 365 is the same thing as Apple's um, their business suite. So from Pages to Notes to uh, the keynote, what is it, keynote? I think it's keynote, what is it, what it's called for their um, PowerPoint presentation application. I'm gonna have a brain fart right there. So all those things are working hand in hand together and how you can utilize those. I think Apple's implementation of it is a little bit better than, uh, than Gemini and Copilot. And Apple's is free, which I mean, you can't beat free. Free is great. I mean, so it, it's, to me, I think how Apple is rolling out is a little bit better. Yeah, you're paying for it when you get the uh, hardware itself, but you're not having that monthly subscription that you would generally get when you have Gemini and then you have, well, some of the features, like they do have some of the free features on like Gemini with Workspace and same thing with Copilot. But then Apple is doing the same thing as far as like Copilot goes when it comes to coding because that's a separate thing that you have to pay for. 
Like if you if you're coding in Visual Studios and you want to use Copilot with that, you have to pay for that to work. Well, Apple is using it with its um I won't have to say Final Cut, <laughs> but with its uh, with its coding its coding application, it's being it's done for for free. So we're gonna dive deeper into that and then show some examples of how it's working and how it's gonna be working across the board with it. So y'all stay tuned for that and let's let's break up into it. So let's dive into it. So we're gonna look at um, some of the features that they have with Gemini, with uh, Copilot, and with uh, what Apple is is showing with uh, Apple Intel, Apple Intelligence. So if we go into here, we're on uh, Gemini's main page. So this is where you typically saw Gemini at when you first logged into uh, Gemini before they came out with uh, actual doing it, integrated with Workspace. And from here, even from here alone, you can just go into your settings, click on extensions, and you see all these extensions that you can uh, pull up from and have a conversation with in Gemini, ask the questions in relation to things that you have uh, in your stuff. So you have, it can be in contact with your uh, Google Maps, Google Hotels, Flights, even Workspace, which we're going to talk about. YouTube and YouTube music. And the only thing you're doing is just typing in the at in front of it when you want to issue a prompt and to pull information from those particular uh, services. So we're not going to really break break down into going to any like examples or anything like that. But this is just how it's being integrated into because if I did this, it would this would be an extremely long video going through a lot of examples. So if you want me, if you want to go want me to, to do some some tutorials on it. Just leave a comment below and then we'll go into more details with it. But I mean, it's something that you can kind of play around with yourself. But if you want me to show you how to do certain things or pull up certain prompts, then just leave a comment uh, down below. But this is just how you initially got into, introduced to Gemini. Now, you can get it done with. Um, so I have a Google Fi account. My business account is under Google Fi. And so I have. I mean, you can see my plan right here. I have a 200 gig plan because I don't need anything more than that because I already have a terabit plan with uh, with Apple on iCloud. And until my business starts scaling up to do more, I don't see a need to upgrade. But this is goal just goes to show that even if you have a if you have a Google Fi account, you do get some of a discount with it. So I, I you know, I already I already get a Google One account having Jim having uh, <laughs> Google Fi, but having Google Fi. And that's just your wireless plan. So I did have a wireless camera. So I have a Pixel 8 Pro for uh, using it with my Google Fire account. But if I upgrade it, so I get paid $7 a month. And with it, I can get Google Workspace, their premium features. And with that, you know, you can just go up from there. Like how much more you stuff you're going to need. Like AI premium is uh, $17 a month. And then, you know, just, just keep going up. So that is a little bit cheaper than what you would have to pay if you were going with the... Uh, Premium amount, like so, the premium for their Gemini is like twenty dollars a month. Same as Chat GPT is twenty 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 two dollars a month. But then, if you come over here to look at what they're charging for using advanced stuff for uh, Google Workspace, and Google Workspace is just having Gemini integrated into it. And one of the videos I should have made it a long time ago, but I did go out to uh, Google's their Google Rise Summit they had here in Atlanta for minority and black owned businesses to kind of help out and introduce them to, to Google Workspace stuff and AI and how it can integrate into your business to help scale your business up to, you know, uh, help automate certain tasks to cut back on you having to have, you know, hire, I hate to say it, but I, I got to say it, just to hiring people that you can have the AI do for you. And you can look at some of the business models they have here and, you know, what you get out of these price plans and all thing it's doing is, you know, you get access to, you know, this research anal analysis analyst, and then you got your sales assistant that kind of helps out with uh, asking the questions and stuff. You get your writing coach that's, that's built into like your Gmail applications, your creative partner, things is, is tagged alongside of like uh, any of the workspace office, I can't say it's the office stuff. And then effects editor, of course, this is in Google Meets. And I'm actually transitioning over into Google Meets from having a Zoom account because to me, this is a lot more functional. I think I can send out, I mean, everybody got a Chrome browser. I think everybody nowadays I, I know has a Chrome browser unless they're specifically using Safari under on their MacBooks. But generally, everybody I know they work out of Chrome. And to me, this is, has a lot more functionality and it's a lot, and it's free to, to use as opposed to me paying. You know, I'm trying to cut down the expenses in my house, uh, paying for a Zoom account. 
So, and then it looks a lot better. Like it's a lot cleaner. It looks a lot better. You can record the sessions and everything. And of course it's transcribes and stuff. So even if you're having a meeting or you want to pull a script from something that somebody's saying that you're interviewing on a call or whatever, you can pull that script using Google's AI. And I, I mean, I like it. I mean, I think it's good stuff, but the question is always about, you know, what are you willing to pay for? Or are you willing to pay anything at all? Because I mean, a lot of us nowadays, you know, we know what the struggle is when, <laughs> when it comes to like stretching every bit of every bit of a dollar that you have and what you want to spend it towards. So now let's go into, and this is just Jim and I working with workspace. So is I do I think it's a good addition to it? I do. Because if you ain't in the Google market, I mean a lot of people I use, especially the like the, the activist stuff that I do or the people I volunteer with. They use a lot of Google services so we can all, you know, kind of work together. And I will say using the workspace is free. And so when you're doing that, you can kind of see who's editing what. And it's not having to be tied into Microsoft's, their system and their Azure system. And then their uh, OneDrive. Everybody has a different cloud platform that you can use with it. Yes. So it's a lot easier to work with people using Google workspaces. I mean, because a lot of people don't have Office 365 accounts because that's a subscription based stuff. And that's kind of what I love. And we won't get towards that when they're talking about Apple. What I love about Apple, because with Apple, their stuff is free. I mean, it comes built into their, their operating with their hardware. And I, it's a trillion dollar company. I mean, I, that's one thing I will say I'm glad using their office applications are all free and it comes built into it. And the beautiful, the beauty part about it is, is that them integrating their AI into it, they haven't announced it yet, but they said it's free. I mean, it's free right now. So some of the things that you're getting when you're looking at what you have to, uh, what you get with this is Apple is giving it to you for free. Now they say you can, if you have a chat GPT account, you can bring that over into and use it alongside, you know, the the new operating system, the upgraded operating system that's coming out where they, they're integrating Apple intelligence with it. But we'll get on that more. But yeah, that's, that's there. You can integrate that into it. How, or what benefits you get out of having that, I have no idea because they didn't explain that in the keynote. And so I guess we have to wait and see what they're going to do with it. I mean, they did talk, um, they did have a, a, a four day, a five day event talking with developers. So I have to go back and kind of go through theirs because I mean, it, it was a long day for their stuff and see if they talked about that at all. But again, we'll, we'll get to that because next I want to get over into uh, Copilot. Now here with Microsoft Copilot, it's the same as Gemini. So you start off in the same standard menu, same as what Gemini will look like when you go into it. And you have your, you know, place where you can put in your command prompts and whatnot. And you can ask it general questions and have, you know, it answer it for you. And a lot of it's coming based off of uh, OpenAI's API with ChatGPT. So Microsoft has its own language model, but of course it has its backup using ChatGPT because it is one of the largest investors in ChatGPT itself. I think they invested like $5 billion, if not if not more, into the company. So whenever you're doing something, just know that you got ChatGPT cooked in it, which is why I, was, I found it intriguing to where, you know, Elon was making a fuss about Apple adding it into Mac OS and then, of course, iOS and then iPad OS. But I'm like... It is no different than what Microsoft did with Copilot because ChatGPT is baked into Copilot itself too. But I guess the the difference in what what Microsoft is doing versus what ChatGPT is doing, they have different different prompts or screens that you can go into to enter, you know, information. It's like from here you got your standard prompt where you're doing like your text based stuff. You can come here and do all this text based, I'm sorry. You can do your text based into image here. You can plan out a vacation, your cooking assistant. Even ask it uh, fitness questions. So I'm, I'm to me, I'm understanding this to be that they have different uh, language models that's working where all these things is geared towards those specific topics itself. So when you ask it, it's more generalized. And I know at least with Gemini and with uh, Copa, I give you some of the resources. You have to ask ChatGPT for the re- to list the resources out. But I know standardly, when you're doing anything, excuse me, with Gemini and with um. Copilot, you'll get the resources that pop up on us. And whenever you ask a question, it's going to list it out for you. When you come here, you can um, look at some of the services it's offering. So, um, but Microsoft stuff, I mean, it is more corporate than anything. So, I mean, if, if you all have small business and stuff, I mean, you pretty much understand how to navigate through this site. I mean, it's a corporate site to me. I mean, it's not for, 
it, they have basic stuff on here, but it's still for generally for businesses and corporations and whatnot. So you you know you're gonna get your Office 365 stuff if you're working on your uh, desktop computer. I think that's why a lot of people that don't want to pay for Microsoft services, they go towards Workspace. Again, we're talking about cost here and saving some money. They go towards Workspace because Workspace is free. So like when you get Chromebooks, you get Workspace integrated into it because Workspace is free stuff, which is why they use it a lot during the pandemic because it wasn't added funds. It had to go towards paying towards a uh, service. But we can look at, uh, no thank you here, uh, kind of the, what they're explaining here on their, their keynote on how Copilot has been integrated into Office 365. So let's just look at that real, uh, really quick. At Microsoft, we recently demonstrated Microsoft 365 Copilot, which transforms how we work by leveraging large language models that interact with your organizational data. Copilot works alongside you. For example, in Word, Copilot can easily write an entirely new document, like a business proposal, using content from your existing files or an Outlook based on content you select, Copilot can compose your email replies for you. In PowerPoint, you can transform your written content into a visually beautiful presentation with a click of a button. In Teams, Copilot can generate meeting summaries with discussed follow-up actions. Or while using business chat in Microsoft Teams, it can help you catch up on something you may have missed, bringing together information from multiple sources to bring you up to speed. If you're wondering how large language models know what they know in these scenarios, let me break down the mechanics of what makes this possible and how the process respects your privacy and keeps your data safe with Microsoft 365 Copilot. First, and I think this is important too to talk about the uh, security behind it too. So let's let's, let's hear them break it down. Let's look at where large language models or LLMs get their knowledge. LLMs are trained on massive amounts of public data, including books, articles, and websites, to learn language, context, and meaning. You can interact with large language models using natural language with what's called a prompt. A prompt is typically a statement or question. When you ask a question in the prompt, the LLM generates a response based on its public data training and understanding of context, which can come in part from how you phrase your prompt. For example, you might give it more details to generate a response. As you continue to ask questions and get responses, the large language model is temporarily getting more context. Your full conversation gets sent with each subsequent prompt, so the LLM can generate relevant responses as you chat with it. It's and it was OneDrive for, for its cloud storage. Processing natural language and referring to its knowledge like we would in a conversation. A key difference is that it only remembers the conversation while it's in that conversation. The chat history is wiped clean with each new conversation. And it won't use the knowledge from your conversations and interactions to train the model. That said, you can also write your prompt to include additional information, which the large language model will refer to as it generates its response. This is how you can give the LLM a little more knowledge it might need to answer your question. I'll show you how this works using Microsoft Bing Chat's GPT-enabled public service that has no affiliation with your organization's data. First, I'll ask it a completely random question that it can't answer. What color shirt am I wearing today? And it responds intelligently. It knows what a shirt is, but it can't see me to answer my question. And, uh, I don't know if this is a good point to be making, but I mean, it's, it's... So when we look at Office 365, this is what we're looking at for regular home users. So this is kind of, this is what I pay generally. Well, no, not generally. This is what I pay. So I pay... Mine's a little bit more than that. I pay... Yeah, I paid uh, $99 for the year. And yeah, say the, uh, it's a family plan. So your personal, you can get to $69.99 for the whole year. And then you're talking about uh, business. You know, you have your different tiers of, of business. So Copilot does come integrated with that. But then, you know, you have extra fees when it comes to Copilot. So let's... You, and like I said, you can see that it's baked into some of the stuff that that my, not some of all the stuff that, that that Microsoft is doing. So this one, like you know, now the race is really beginning and see who's going to use what. But the problem I have when it comes to Microsoft, again, is very very business oriented. So I mean, it's going to take time to just like people don't want to sit here and work on complicated stuff when it comes to technology based things. They don't want to sit here and try to like dig down deep and try to find what they need out of Microsoft stuff. If you got a business, I mean, yeah, you can do that. 
But that's why people, I think people like the simplicity of doing stuff with uh, Workspace, Google Workspace, and with with um, Apple because it's like, and you can say it's it's kid friendly and it's too kiddy, but I mean it's functional. It's it's easy. I'm not having to come through all of these different things just to find what I'm looking for and to see what I want to purchase or what I want to add on. It's already there. And so let's dive into what Apple is doing with Apple Intelligence. And then we'll, you know, summarize everything up to close out the video because I don't want it to be too long, even though it's probably getting long right now. I don't want it to be too long. I'm just trying to break through all three, all the three, three different models that's out there now. Not different models, but all the three different applications or platforms that's out there now for you to use AI with and for you to decide, you know, which one you want to use. Me personally, I have a 365 account. I can use any of the three because I do have all three of them. <laughs> but right now I'm working from a desktop, Windows desktop computer. But when I'm on the go, I do have my MacBooks. So I do have one of the M1 MacBooks that I use, and I love it. I mean, I, I would prefer to use a uh, Mac for my desktop application stuff, but Mac hadn't gotten into video games yet. And what I'm working off of is my custom-built PC that I built myself. And, of course, to do play games or any of those things, you have to have – you don't have to, but you want to have a custom-built uh, custom built computer. And we don't have games like that that works with Apple GPUs right now. They, they're doing that, but – I wish there was a way because I do prefer Mac OS as opposed to Windows. I generally prefer Linux over a lot of them, but I prefer Mac OS because of what I can do with it and because of my Mac ecosystem here that Microsoft does not have and uh, Google don't have as of right now. So, yeah, so let's get into Apple Intelligence. So with Apple Intelligence, Apple just introduced it at its Dub Dub event they just had a couple of weeks ago, or whenever you're watching this, it was the first part of June. And they pretty much integrated into their own, their AI, their their language models into, uh, which, I mean, they technically have already, so this is the thing I have when it comes to talking about AI stuff and people and this fascination behind it, because I'm like, a lot of stuff, We've already had AI baked into it. I mean, that's what Siri is. I mean, that's what uh, Bing is. And so that's what a lot of these these applica- these these assistants are. They are language learning models that we've already had cooked into our system. I think it's blown up even more because of Chat GPT. And of course, Apple had to you know add more into it. So it's language learning models, machine machine learning models, and to get into it, make it more integrated into the systems and make it more robust. Because we already know that uh, using Siri was trash. And you had more functionality out of asking um, Google questions than anything. But um, so now that they have it baked into it, it's supposed to make it a little bit smart. I guess it's something that we have to play around with once it's, they, you know, once they really introduced that. I'm part of the beta program, so I do have it on my device, but I don't have, they haven't rolled the Apple intelligence out just yet. And with this, I mean, now, <laughs> so let's, let's, let's start, let's pause right there for a second. So, I think it's, it's interesting that people don't know this. And I don't think it's interesting because if you're not a part of the community and you're not, I guess, nerdy per se, you won't know. So to me, I think how this is set up on their, their main page is um, is important because the, the layout is you have the Apple intelligence. And then when you see below, they're advertising the iPhone, iPhone 15 Pro. They could have said an iPhone 15 they could have said anything. Well, the purpose of that, to me, I think, in my opinion, is the only way you're going to get Apple intelligence on your device, you have to have a 15 Pro and a 15 Pro Max. Now, you're asking yourself, why do I need that? Because their neural networks only work on the A17 chips that's on the Apple 15 Pro and the Apple the uh, the iPhone 15 Pro Max. So the, the reason that being, in order for any language learning model or any AI stuff, it to work and work locally because Apple wants their stuff to work locally. So let's, I mean, let's break that down to a little bit too. And again, I tell me I don't want this video to be too long, but I want to, I want people to understand this because I see a lot of people complaining about, you know, why, you know, why the older devices can't work. And I was like, it's the same reason it doesn't work on pixel phones. Older pixel phones can't, they don't work using Gemini integrated into a system like that because they don't have the cores. So at minimum for having a, AI system work on your local based system. You have to have four cores and you have to have eight gigs of mem- eight gigs of memory to work for it to work. Like just the RAM alone has to be eight gigs at minimum. 
And iPhones, if you ever listen to Apple's keynotes when they talk about iPhones and the hardware and stuff, they never mention memory because they never had 8 gigs of memory. It was always, or, you know, anything from 6 or above. They, their stuff has always been about applic- their software applications or the software itself and how the software knows how to work with its hardware, which it does, and it works flawlessly without hardly any problems. I mean, we do have quirks here and there with people and their stuff. I mean, I have it a lot of times with my stuff. But at the end of the day, it knows how to handle what it handles on the hardware that it has built into its system. But for it to work, for AI to work locally on the device, which is what you want for security, you have to have at least four cores. And I'm talking about four cores of processing power from your CPU. And then you need to have eight gigs of memory built into it for, to be able to, you know, uh, query stuff or whatever, you know, for all AI to work. Just not need to get into more nerdy stuff than you just like, huh? What are you talking about? So, I think this is kind of intentional when you look at Apple Intelligence on the website itself. It has Apple Intelligence up in the 15 Pro because it's letting you know that it is enticing you. If you want those features, you're going to have to upgrade. Now, a lot of this stuff, you can see it as gimmicky. I mean, it, I mean, you can have gen emojis where you generate your own emojis, which is what this, dog, the new, this new emojis, I'm skipping past that. But the other features on here... I don't think are gimmicks to summarize like your um, emails and stuff and separate it. I have a separate application when it comes to emails too. So I can know what to filter through. I mean, Google and Google has always had it too, with Gmail, you know, what's promotions, what's social media stuff and actually what's generalized emails. It's not a marketing stuff. Like they really meant to come to you. So Gmail has already, Google has already had to baked into its email services and I use a third-party application to look at some of this stuff, too. But what they're doing now is, I guess they finally listen to people and they paid attention. They're baking, they're, they're, they're doing, adding all those features into, the, you know, iPhone or to, to uh, iOS. And, of course, it's coming to all the other, you know, operating systems they have, from iPadOS to macOS Sequoia. And if you care about that, it's a reason to upgrade like if you don't have an M1 chip for your MacBook or you know a desktop, your desktop, your, your you know other stuff, I I mean if you care about those features, I think it's a good time to, to upgrade for iPhone users. I, unless you're using it, I mean I don't think so. I mean I'm gonna do it because I care about that kind of stuff. I mean I like using it, but I think a lot of stuff is gimmick because a lot of people don't even use it, have the stuff they have on their phone now, which is why I hate the whole Android versus iOS de- debate. It's like. Android, yeah, you can customize a lot of stuff on your device, but a lot of people not even doing that anymore. Especially, I mean, you can do it with Samsung stuff because Samsung has it baked into a system where it's easy to customize. Google, you can do some customizations on the, with the Pixel lineups, and those are major ones. I mean, of course, they got Huawei and some of these other Android devices out there where you can. But anyway, Android, you can customize whatever you want. But at the end of the day, a lot of people aren't doing that. They're doing the basic stuff. They do the same thing they're doing on an iPhone. They send in text messages. They take a certain, they, they're searching social media. They're using it for phone calls. <laughs> they have their favorite apps that they're using on a day to day basis, and they're taking pictures. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the only thing people are doing. So I don't understand this whole debate of, oh, we had this or we had that. And it's like, yeah, if the nerdy people or the people that like tinkering around with their phones have had that for a long time. But at the end of the day, most people don't use all that stuff. So when you start talking about, uh, the AI things are put into it now. A lot of it is gimmicky. Because, I mean, like I said, Pixel has had this. So if you got a Android device or you have a Pixel, you have Gemini on there now. Like they they've actually has an application for it, and they actually have a text a text built into its messaging system, so you can text Gemini, and ask it questions. It create can't create images, but it can ask, answer any question that you ask and build out stuff for you that you can you know send out through email or whatever. But now they have Gemini added into email, so it can proofread emails and stuff. So are people using it? Probably not, because they don't even understand how AI <laughs> generally works, which is a lot of a lot of frustration that I'm seeing with people, especially older people. They was like, they hate AI. And I'm like, why do you hate AI? I'm like, it's no different than you Googling something. I'm like, you can just talk to it. But a lot of these features you can see as, as gimmicky. I mean, from having all these things built into all of Apple's ecosystems, if you don't care about those things, same thing that I showed you with Workspace, same thing I showed you with Copilot with Office 365. You can see it as a gimmick. I see it as a tool because I think it's very helpful because you can use it to cut down on tasks. And for me, it's helping because I have an Apple device. I mean, I have both of them, but I generally work off of my iPhone. 
Like I generally work off my iPhone unless I'm handling some business out somewhere and I'm on my Pixel. But a lot of the times I'm on my iPhone because that's where my family is texting me at. So that's why I spend most of my time at because I got family texting me on my, my iPhone. And then when I'm not on my desktop computer, I'm either on my iPad or I'm on my um my MacBook. So it's like I I care about those features and I like to have them. And I like how you can... It's, they all have the same thing. They can summarize things for you. But the one thing I do like about it is, like, you can ask uh, Siri questions, and it'll query through all of your stuff on your device. Now, that's one of the key things, and it's kind of why I'm scrolling through you now so you can see it and see how it's working. And I'm going to play a part of the keynote, too, to show you how they have some of the stuff built into it. But the thing I like about it, and I kind of spoke about it in a, a, a short that I did, well, how it's looking at stuff locally. So I care about local stuff versus cloud stuff because it's a separation of data and how you pull in that data. So one of the questions I asked at the Google Rise Summit was, if I wanted to use your API, let's say I'm, I'm, I care, I care about my data and my personal data and not it and not have it having access or being able to get cloud access because some of the stuff I want to keep locally, kind of like what I do on my regular nine to five. A lot of stuff that we work on in the lab is not. You can't get to it remotely. So everything is stored in-house locally on the servers. So we have to, when we want to work on something, we have to work on devices that's connected locally to those, those, those servers for us to work off of. So they don't have any cloud access. So I was like, what it, is there a way for us to be able to use the, the API? So if I'm querying data, it can query data locally. It's like using a, a multi-access, like MEC system, like a multi-access edge computing system to where it can query data off of my MEC system and send it to me. But then if I have other questions that's not part of my MEC system, it goes and access the cloud and it can send it over to me. The customer success manager said he think it's possible and it should be able to do that. But the thing about Apple is Apple said it at the keynote, that's what it's going to do. It's going to keep, which is why you have to have a newer iPhone to be able to do that. Because if you care about your data and you don't want anybody having access to your data uh, through a cloud way, even though technically, I mean, they don't. I mean, I'm going to be real with y'all. It's, it's hard as hell to hack a, a cloud a cloud server. Can it happen? Anything is possible. I'm not going to sit here and say nothing's possible. No, anything is possible, but it's going to take a lot of effort. But if you care about security like that, and I kind of care about security like that to a degree, uh, you want stuff local, then I want the API that gives me access into their language, their learning models to where if I ask it something, it can go, it can break the data out through the, uh, through packet headers to where now I know it's going to access my local stuff to answer personal questions. And anything that's not related to my personal stuff is going to go out to the cloud to get that information and give it back to me. That way there's a separation of the two, but they all coming together through, uh, they're all being accessed and queried through the API or the AI itself. So it's knowing where to look for what at without the cloud having access to, like it's not two-way communication. So the cloud doesn't have access to my local stuff. The only integration they have into that is using the uh, AI to where it knows if I'm asking it a personal question, it can query data off of my local server. And that's what Apple, again, is doing with Apple Intelligence, is querying it off of your local computers, which is why you have to have a new chip, the newer chipsets, like the M1 series and above. And then when you're talking about the mobile system, it has to have an A17 chip within it. So, and I mean, I understand people don't like that, but I mean, at the end of the day, everybody cares about their personal data. I mean, I, I, I'm seeing all this stuff now. People care about... They're talking about, you know, the government having access to what, or they're talking about Snapchat or what is it, TikTok, and the Chinese government is using their data to do whatever, which is just cap, but still. So if you care about your data, you want your data stuff stored locally. So if anything is being accessed, you want all that stuff being queried locally and not into the cloud-based stuff, which is why it's important, which is why I'm glad they, they decided to go their route and not have it done strictly from the cloud. Because if you don't know, Apple stuff is baked into iCloud. So whatever you're doing on your device outside of messages is all stored and synced up through iCloud. So if you ever bought a new device or you lost your device, that backup is on iCloud itself and you can restore from backup from iCloud. And now some of the stuff I'm showing you on here is, you know, this general, it's a lot of gimmicky stuff. But anyway, privacy-wise... Yes, Apple is doing it. Right off the rip, Apple is doing it. Uh, Google didn't do that just yet because all that stuff is cloud-based anyway. <laughs> and uh, Copilot, 
they do some of that, but they don't speak too much on like the security features of it. So I still think it's two way communication between both your local device and your cloud storage device because a lot of stuff is built into one drive too. So if you have a Windows machine, is uh, generally a lot of it's being uh, backed up to one drive. So anything that you ask in it, it is querying it off of your local stuff, but the cloud has access to it too. And we all know the the vulnerabilities that happen with Microsoft. Excuse me, if you don't know that. They do have, and it's because it's the most popular kid on the block. They have a lot of uh, security vulnerabilities that come through Windows machines, especially over the years. So now we get back into this, you can see that uh, these like these gen emojis, like this is gimmicky stuff. I do like the image one. You can um, transform like rough sketch into re uh, related images and notes. So I like how this stuff is like baked into like Apple's main applications on Mac OS and then you know iOS. And then, of course, Sequoia. Now, the only thing that they don't have that everybody else does have, there's no straight way. I don't think. Yes, it is. So you can query. Now you can query Siri directly by asking it questions. But there is no, like, I guess, app. No, not me. Web URL that you can type, go into, like they have with Copilot and like they have with Gemini and ask it questions. I don't even know that you can even get it to create images like that. I don't think that you can. I'm glad that you can now ask it questions, but yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think that you can do that. And like it's telling you, it's, it's integrated with it, but that's, I mean, that's, that's generally it. So you have it baked into like as your um, main applications and stuff. And I might probably don't even need to show you the, the keynote because this is, you know, this is some of the same thing I've been talking about with Office 365 and Copilot. And it because it's doing the exact same thing. So if you have a question, you want to generate a story, you can do all that if, within pages. Or if you have like with keynote, you want to create like this, this PowerPoint presentation. It's kind of funny because you're just saying keyboard, but you actually know it's by PowerPoint. You can do some of the similar things. It can create images for you within that the application itself. And it's the same thing. We can transcribe emails for you. You can summarize stuff uh, throughout your email. You can ask a question, ask, you know, serious questions. And I guess this really was boiling down to is like asking serious questions and seeing where it can pull the data from. It's scraping the data from to give you an answer, no matter if it's on your email system or your text messages or in your photos, it can answer all that stuff for you. So yeah, I mean, we you don't need to see any more of that when it comes to like the keynote because I mean, I'm I'm telling you a lot of it right now, and I'm you're seeing a lot of it on screen too, of how it's gonna work with the Apple ecosystem. It's up to you to decide now, like which one are you gonna work with. So if you're primarily working off of a MacBook, I think this is a good a, a plus for you. And as you can see, I mean, you see across the top, there are no where, where do you see prices at? Like we, we, this is whole Apple's website. It's all free. <laughs> I mean, ChatGPT does charge you for their, their pro services, but Apple stuff is is free now. Unless Apple um goes in and changes some stuff up, and they say they're going to eventually charge you for a subscription based stuff, which I don't see them doing it. To me, this is a a massive selling tool for them. This is a plus for Mac users. I mean, we already pay a lot for their hardware anywhere, right? So to me, this is a plus for all of us because you get their AI applications totally free with your stuff. And that beats out. And I will save this for the end because you saw the price plans with Office 365 and the same thing with uh, Google Workspace. Some of it's free, but a lot of it you have to pay for. Like Office 365, you got to pay for that. Like you don't have access to uh, Windows and stuff for free. You can look at it, you can view it, but when it comes to editing or saving documents, you got to pay for it. Workspace, a lot of that stuff is free, but then they have the, the more advanced stuff like you can get here with Apple. It's not free. It's a, it's a monthly subscription for it, depending on where you have. Like I got like I, said, I got Google Fi, so I get a discount on it. But if you don't have any, if you don't have a wireless service, it's like $20 a month to get access to all of that stuff and be able to use some of their, their advanced AI features. So, yeah, in the comment section below, yeah, let me know what y'all going to use with it. And um, I think that, again... This is a perk. I think now we have, every, everybody's got their, 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 their cards on the table and it's interesting to see how it's going to be played. I think Apple coming out and Apple being Apple is going to be better than everybody else. Of course, they have to catch up when it comes to uh, language models because Google was the first one out there. 
I don't think a lot of people even recognize that or paid attention to it. Google been doing AI for a very long time. Like they have been doing it literally for a very long. I mean, that's what you're searching is your search is for. They've been doing it for a long, long time. So now that you know open AI came out with their stuff and that's how Microsoft invested into it because now it helps them to not, they, they don't have to do it in-house. They can get it from somebody else using their APIs and stuff. But to see Apple come out late in the game, they actually showing out better than everybody else. I mean, they don't have all the features that you have. I mean, of course you can still float between any of, well, in my opinion, any of the two, not the three. I don't use Copilot for a lot of stuff, and I don't use Microsoft Edge, even though Edge is a lot, a lot cleaner now. Like I, I play around with it a lot, but yeah, I'm I'm still between uh, Chrome and Arc. I use Arc. If y'all don't know about Arc browser, I use Arc browser a lot, uh, but I, I'm primarily on Chrome too. Uh, but Edge, I mean, is Microsoft waited a little late to get that fixed up, and it's still a lot going on. If you open up Edges, it's it's a lot. You know what? I just I I bring it up now. So this is Edge. This is the layout of Edge. So I mean y'all see myself across the top, but of course I don't you're not gonna catch me slipping on some uh I'm not looking at no derogatory stuff. This is all my my personal stuff. But um yeah, it's I mean it's a lot going on. But you know, hey, you get copilot built into it. So if you want to ask it questions, you can ask it directly from the browser. Chrome doesn't have that. Yeah, there is no tab directly for Gemini. I mean, you see my, my account right here, but there is no tab directly for, for Gemini. So, I mean, it's you can see it's, it's like automatically over here. I think that was smart for Microsoft to do that. But I think Chrome, I think Google need to go ahead and do that with Chrome. But, um, yeah. So y'all, let me know below. What, I mean, what y'all gonna be playing with? What do y'all, what, what do y'all use right now? I, I still think AI is a tool. I'm not worried about it. I mean, I would like to see an actual uh, learning a blah 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 a language model that actually speaks back and forth. That you chat GPT does now allow you to ask it questions and it respond back. But I want to actually see one that's you can hold conversations with. Like it's just it, once you sit down at your computer, it automatically comes with playing in the background, so you can actually talk to it. And, you know, it's, it's knowing what's going on. It's, it's knowing from your desktop and stuff. And it's all local-based stuff. So even if you are doing, if you want to, you know, like 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 Flossie Carter said, if you're doing some scumbag activity, it knows to look past that. So if you're asking it questions, it can answer those questions without it, uh, pulling up some of your scumbag stuff. So, yo, how are y'all using AI today? Are you excited about now that Apple is into the race and you have Apple intelligence? You, I mean, of course, that name is just kind of to play on, Apple, on, on, on artificial intelligence. But how are y'all going to be using it? If you are using it, what are you using it for? So, yeah, leave a comment down below and go ahead and, yeah, and follow the channel for more technology stuff. Again, I've separated the content now for um, when my streams and a lot of my gaming stuff is going towards the House of Matrix channel. So if you like gaming content and strictly just gaming content, Follow me over there. I'm going to keep this more, you know, what, is, what is the, the channel is for. Politics, technology, and gaming. But gaming is not always about video games. It's about the game of life. So I may post some gaming content here and there. But a lot of it is going to be about political talk and technology talk. So if you if you follow me, my channel is strictly for the games. Kind of follow me on House of Matrix too because it's going to be all nothing. This is just nothing but video games itself and me playing games and me streaming. So it's all on the House of Matrix. So Check that channel out. Follow me over there. Follow me on here. Turn on your notification bell for when I do updates. Again, I'm trying to get more consistent. I have, you know, life Life is always life with me, and I'm, I'm trying to run a business on top of it, too. So I'm planning on doing more uploads throughout the week, more so than just one or two. I'm planning on trying to get at least three to four episodes uploaded throughout the course of the week. And, of course, I'm streaming. I'll be streaming on the other channel. But uh, turn on notification bells. And... Again, if y'all are looking to get a podcast started or you're looking for any form of content creation that's almost in podcast type material, I do have a book out called The Ultimate Technical Guide to Creating a Podcast. It is available now on my website, ptgtv.online. That is ptgtv.online. So go check it out. It helps you get started from beginning to the end. And if you purchase it from me directly, then you can schedule a free one-on-one -on -one consultation for anything that you have you need help with. I don't care if it's video editing, audio editing, or trying to help you out with ways to market your or podcast to other um, to corporations and stuff, and to get a pitch deck set up for you. 
So uh, it's on my website, again, pgdtv.online, but it is available across other platforms. So it is on Amazon, it is on Apple iBooks, and it is on uh, the Google uh, Google Store, Play, I think it's Playbooks, to uh, purchase there as well. So thank y'all for tuning in to this episode. Hope y'all stay safe. Apologies for always for the delays and stuff. Again, I am trying to be this content creator, but I'm trying to get stuff out there as timely as I can and when I have the time to do it, the time and the energy to do that because life is always life. But until the next time, love you all. Y'all be safe. You out. In the end, we're going to make the chat. Then we're going to hit the show. Part two, we don't need no pause. You can't miss